Okay. Um, good morning. I think we can start now. What do you think? Yes, please. Okay. So, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Taz and Maz. Thank you for joining us here again for another um, BioWeb discussion session. Today, Dr. Atino Keajuloko, the senior registrar at the Bafema Wolowa University Hospitals Complex, Ileife, will be leading the discussion on surgical options for primary open angle glaucoma. Thank you. Um, during the course of the presentation, if you have, have any questions, comments, clarifications, you can put them in the chat box. Thank you. So, Dr. Ajulok, over to you. Hello, Dr. Ajulok. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yedun. Am I audible? Yes, I Hello? can hear you. Okay, thank you. I can you. hear you. Thank you, Dr. Oyedo. Thank you so much. And uh, a big thank you to God and to the ESCOs for the opportunity to make this presentation today. I I am Atenuke Achiloko, as introduced by Dr. Oyedo, and I will be taking this um, topic. It's called Surgical Options for Primary Open Hand Glaucoma, using this half line. Look, we can't see your screen anymore. You can't see your screen. You can't see your slides. Sorry. We're seeing your faces. Sorry, sorry. Sorry, I'm coming for a minute. Can you see it? No? Can you see my screen, please? Can you see my screen, please? Not yet. I can't see your screen yet. Okay. How about now, please? Can you see my screen? Yes. I can see your title page. Thank you. Yes. So using this outline, um, glaucoma is defined as a multifactorial progressive neurodegenerative disorder with characteristic acquired death of the retinal ganglion cells and loss of their axons, as well as atrophy of the optic nerve head, which is typified by the pale cup disc and characteristic visual field defect. This results in the loss of neurons in the lateral geniculate nucleus and in visual cortex. Primary open hand glaucoma is characterized by an intraocular pressure of greater than 21 millimeters of mercury, glo characteristic glaucoma optic neuropathy, and open anterior chamber angle on glonoscopy, characteristic visual field loss as damage progresses, and absence of signs of secondary glaucoma. Um, glaucoma facts and figures by World Health Organization in 2010. This is just to show how it helps, how important the disease called glaucoma or primary open angle glaucoma is. Globally, glaucoma blindness accounts for 0 0.7 to 1,000 across all ages, and in the African subregion, it is 1.5 for every 1,000 population. And mm -hmm. glaucoma blindness, that means glaucoma blindness is 7 to 10 times higher, especially in blacks compared to whites. Primary open angle glaucoma accounts for 90% of all forms of glaucoma, and uh, the global prevalence is 3.54, 4.2% in Africa, and 5.02% in Nigeria. The prevalence of blindness among glaucoma patients is about 5 to 10%. Worldwide, over 3 million people are bilaterally blind from primary open angle glaucoma. And uh, globally, over 2 million people will develop the disease each year. People of African descent are more likely to develop glaucoma early in life and have a more progressive form of the disease. 
a higher prevalence of larger cup to this ratio exists in the normal black population as compared with white controls. Relevant anatomy. The, the drainage of aqueous is very essential. Aqueous is produced from the non-pigmented ciliary epithelium. Why the drainage is via the anterior chamber angles? In primary open angle glaucoma, the obstruction to flow is actually at the level of the uh, oh, uh, at the level of the angles. So you can see the production of aqueous um, in the figure A, the A part on the top left hand corner, aqueous is produced and it migrates between the ciliary um, iris and the lens into from the posterior chamber to the anterior chamber and then into the angles. So this box, this small box represents the angles. This small box magnified. We have the trabecular meshwork, which has three parts, the uvoscleral part, corneosclera part, and just the canalicular part. The area of greatest resistance is at the level of this just the canalicular trabecular meshwork. And the resistance to flow of aqueous at this point due to aging and some other factors primary factors are the causes uh, leads to the uh, development of primary open angle glaucoma. So fluid is essentially drained into the Schlem's canal, to the collector pack channels, and then to the systemic circulation. So here, yeah, this figure in my on my right uh, right hand side is showing the sclera bed, the sclera spore, the trabecular measure, which I will still talk about later. Brief pathophysiology. Aqueous humor outflow, when there is a resistance to aqueous humor outflow, there is pressure build up within the eyes and resulting in elevated intraocular pressure. This will also lead to the mechanical theory, which is highly implicated in the pathogenesis of primary open angle glaucoma. Also, genetic factor has uh, substantially been explained uh, because individuals with genetic predisposition or mutation in some genes are, like, are more likely to have uh, a primary open angle glaucoma, a family history of glaucoma. Then tropic support failure, the glare system. So the vascular theory is essentially not compromised in primary open angle glaucoma. Studies have shown that it is more implicated in the pathogenesis of normal tension glaucoma. The actual, the total uh, explanation for the pathophysiology of primary open angle glaucoma is not known, but the, patch, the, the, the known one, all, the, all these factors that are explained, have a final common pathway, which is the optic nerve head damage and retinal ganglion cell and axon loss, which results in visual loss. The risk factors for primary open angle glaucoma, the most essential is age. The aging process leads to some structural changes in the heart flow channels, especially at the level of the trabecular meshwork, and there is subsequent elevated intraocular pressure, followed by family history, black rings, elevated intraocular pressure, gender, male gender, my, uh, myopia, vascular diseases, hypertension, and some other factors. The symptoms. The primary open angle glaucoma is of insidious onset. It's painless and progressive. It is asymptomatic until a significant visual field loss has occurred. The patient may have headache, eyeache, non-specific complaint, and there may be delayed dark adaptation time and frequent changes of presbyopic glasses. On exam, history taking is very essential in this patient. The ocular history, the age of onset, the duration, um, the characteristics of the visual field loss, any family history, family history is very essential. Then systemic factor, is this patient diabetic? Is this patient hypertensive? Is there history of migraine? Is there history of any systemic abnormalities? Then the family history, I've talked about how important it is. Medication is also important. Is this patient an hypertensive patient on ocular hypertensive drugs? The systemic, uh, in examination, the general examination of the patient and systemic examination is also essential. The respiratory system is, uh, and the cardiovascular system. The respiratory system, especially if you want to give medical 
drugs, which were, I'm not talking about today, the cardiovascular system, the pulse rate, the blood pressure, very essential. Eye examination. The visual acuity in primary open angle glaucoma is variable depending at this or uh, depending on the stage at which the patient presents. If it is at the advanced stage, the patient the vision will be um, impaired, while if it is at the early stage, the vision may be normal. The anterior segment examination is essential, assessing the ocular surface, cornea. This is very important in order to rule out the differential diagnosis to rule out any secondary cause of glaucoma to confirm that it is actually a primary open angle glaucoma as in, in making and confirming the diagnosis. So the intraocular pressure check to know the baseline pressure in order to calculate its target pressure. The patient may be advised to do a water drinking test, nocturnal facing. Conioscopy also is essential to confirm the diagnosis of primary open angle glaucoma in which all the angle structures will be seen to the point of the ciliary body. The optic disc examination in glaucoma is a core is a core examination in the making the in making diagnosis of glaucoma. So it is very essential when doing posterior pole examination to pay attention to the scleral rim, the neuroretinal rim, looking out for the easing through violation of the easing through. Because if the disc is large, the cup is large. But if the easing through is preserved, you may sleep. But when the cup is large, the disc is large, the easing through is violated, you need to, to look more. The retinal nerve fiber layer thickness using a green light, parapapillary changes, alpha zoom, beta zoom, the disc color and vessel, also very essential to confirm whether this is actually a glaucomatous neuropathy or otherwise. The disc size and cup to this ratio, disc hemorrhages, which is a sign of progression, it could be a sign of an existing disease. This hemorrhage can, is not only seen in normal tension glaucoma, it can also be seen in primary open angle glaucoma. And the cause is actually due to the loss of uh, uh, support is due to loss of support which makes the vessels to be very friable, the small uh, vessels and so they bleed easily. This anomalies like uh, optic speed, coloboma, in order to be sure that we are actually dealing with glaucoma. So this is a, the first picture here is a picture uh, showing the fundus picture showing loss of neuroretinarium. You can see that the inferior neuroretinarium here is so the isn't true in this uh, this case violated. There could also be bearing of the blood vessels. These blood vessels are bad because of the la uh, loss of the nerve fibers and uh, and loss of the support, loss of the of their support. So the vessels that were initially covered are now very obvious. You can see in this first picture, it's just a faint view of the vessel, but. In the other picture, we can see that there is a obvious, the, the vessel becomes very obvious. That is bearing of the blood vessel due to loss of support. Then there can also be bionating, and uh, this is like uh, is usually described like uh, the handle of a walking stick, and it's also due to the uh, cupping, posterior bowing of the uh, lacrimal cubosa at this point, which is a bending of the vessels. So the investigation, parchimetry is very essential to determine the actual central cornea thickness. If the central cornea thickness is falsely high, it gives a falsely high intraocular pressure. And when it is uh, less than 500 uh, uh, 14 micrometer it gives a falsely low intraocular pressure. This sorry, this second one where I wrote I refer to the central cornea thickness. The perimetry is very very essential, uh, and the standard that is done is automatic automatic static threshold per perimetry. This is the uh, standard where all by uh, all other ones are compared, and um, I'll still talk about it as I go on. The optical coherence tomograph assessment is also very essential, looking at the optic nerve topography, the retinal nerve fiber layer, and the ganglion uh, cell complex analysis, especially to confirm um, the, the diagnosis, the corpus ratio, to determine the disc damage likelihood uh, scale, 
whether it is a uh, high risk uh, or advanced disease or borderline and in order to for monitoring this uh, optic this this damage likelihood scale is essential is essential the this damage likelihood scale in OCT printout is essential to know the ba baseline to monitor for progression is an objective way of monitoring because at times uh, um, central visual field assessment the perimetry may not be reliable the patients may not be cooperative and uh, you, such that you cannot use the results Okay, the perimetry printout may show different. Uh, these are the characteristic visual field affecting in glaucoma: nasal step, paracentral scotoma, temporal wedge, altitudinal uh, scotoma, acute scotoma, or in advanced cases, we may have um, both superior and inferior hemifield acute scotoma, which can give a ring scotoma. So it spares the central. Um, 10 degree to fixation in glaucoma is paired. That is the last point that is lost. And eventually, if there is blindness, the patient can no longer see. There is total loss of the visual field. The treatment option for primary open angle glaucoma. The, generally, the aim of treatment in glaucoma is to prevent blindness and to improve the quality of life. And many studies have shown that it is essential to intervene when the diagnosis of glaucoma is made, either medically, by laser or surgical, and that intervening reduces the progression of the disease. So the treatment options are medical, laser, and surgical. So today I'll be talking about surgical. Um, and maybe someone can help me at the end of this presentation. In the literature, I found that some people classify laser as surgical some classified it as a single entity so i don't really know where to classify laser and i would like also to note that the treatment of glaucoma is individualized even the surgical treatment depending on the age of the patient at presentation the extent of the damage that was noticed at the presentation patient motivation is a patient that is well motivated and social economic factor is it a patient that is financially st stable that will be able to actively be involved in the medication in the treatment or is not so those are the things we consider before commencing treatment for glaucoma the surgical option the indication for the surgical options include uncontrolled intraocular pressure despite maximum medical therapy and laser trabeculoplasty non-compliance with medical therapy allergic reactions to medication primary treatment option as a primary treatment option for highs with advanced disease like when there is very high intraocular pressure advanced copying and visual field loss and patient preference the patient may want uh, may say he or she wants surgery and that after counseling you go ahead to give the surgery the grouping of the surgical option is uh, is basically into five the penetrating filtration surgery the guarded one which we, we which is the gold standard is trabeculectomy. The non -fil penetrating filtration surgery includes deep sclerectomy, viscocanalostomy, and viscocanaloplasty. We have glaucoma drainage devices, minimally invasive glaucoma surgery, and cartilage surgery. Pre op evaluation. Patient counseling and informed consent is very essential when counseling a patient when before taking in a patient for glaucoma surgery. So so that the patient can really understand that it's different from cataract surgery and the expectations to have. Ocular examination is also very in essential to confirm the diagnosis, to rule out uh, risk factors for endophthalmitis like high discharge, to rule out heights that may fail, then to, to note the height that will be operated on and to note the pre operative intraocular pressure, whether to, you need to control the pressure acutely with uh, hyperosmotic agents before you go in for surgery 
or not. Systemic examination also essential to know this, uh, 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 how stable the patient is, the physical condition of the patient, that is also the respiratory rate. The vital signs are essentially the temperature, the respiratory rate, the pulse rate, the blood pressure, and chest examination. Don't want a patient with cough or um, um, fluid filled lungs. Don't want the, such patient to have surgery. Patient selection is very essential. All the um, all the th the first three are very important in patient selection. It's good. It's very important to select a good patient to have a good outcome. And if you are having a bad patient, the surgeon is aware. The patient himself or, or herself is also aware that they are bad selection. But the surgery is essential for whatever reason you have. Then. Do you want the surgery to be a day case or admission? This depends on the surgeon's expertise and confidence and the environment, the setup, this, this clinic setup, whether they can handle a day case or it's better they have a, uh, they, they admit the patient. Anesthesia, generally local anesthesia is you done, but for children, when you want to do surgery for children, for, for patients, adults that may not even cooperate, it's better to do a general anesthesia. Then the fasting blood sugar to con confirm the blood sugar of the patient. I think I should put this. I should have. It should be under the investigations before surgery. Sorry. So now number one, trabeculectomy, which is the gold standard of all the surgical options for for glaucoma. So the initial step is for anesthesia to position the patient give anesthesia or the type, whatever type of anesthesia you want to do, whether LA or general anesthesia, depending on your findings. Then painting of the surgical area with 10% povidone iodine, dripping of the patient, exposure of the eyeball using highly speculum, and brittle suture, application of brittle suture, uh, clear cornea, clear cornea brittle suture. Then raising of the phonics-based conjunctival flap. After raising of the flap, a blunt dissection is done to a, a blood dissection is done into the posterior furnaces to have a space to put uh, anti-metabolites in, in order to prepare a, for a diffuse blood. So blunt dissection is done posteriorly and laterally. And um, then the anti-metabolites cutting, uh, cutting tip soaked in anti-metabolites, depending on which one you want to use, fibroacy or mitomycin C is uh, soaked in a uh, cotton tip is soaked in it and all uh, another thing is used i can't remember the name so it's inserted into the furnace like uh, the space you have created the subtenon space you have created after the blunt dissection uh, post the uh, raising of the flap and put put in there for three to five minutes after which it is irrigated out the f the the cotton wick is removed then irrigated copiously with saline. Then a flap, the the sclera flap is raised. A limba based sclera flap, about three to four mm in size, and it is raised. Then reflected towards the cornea. Paracentesis is subsequently done. There's then after the paracentesis, a scission of the trabecular tissue. So the limba based sclera flap is reflected towards the cornea in order to have a view of the blue line so it is said that uh, where the blue meets the white shrine base line awaits you so you 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 reflect the sclera flap until you see the blue line and when you see the blue line you you make a rectangular excision a tip block excision of the uh, trabecular tissue at that point uh, it can either be done with uh, the incision can be done with a blade but it can be done with a blade then use the scissors can be used to cut it off but Kelly sponge can also be used and Kelly sponge is better in order to prevent injury to the t uh, lens with and subsequent cataract to prevent damage to the uh, to prevent the deep from being the block from being too deep. When it is too deep, it extends into the vitreous. And when it gets into the vitreous, you are at risk of 
failure already from the beginning so you want to avoid that so uh, Kelly sponge is preferably used peripheral iridectomy is subsequently done closure of the fab is done subconjunctival closure is also done and the subconjunctival injection of steroid and antibiotic combination then the hair is padded I can see the questions popping up. I'll I'll talk about the the answers after the presentation. I'm noting them. My slide is on. So this is all I've been trying to talk about: limbar-based conjunctival flap, outline of the superficial sterile flap, then the dissection to a size. This is the dissection for the deep sclerectomy. Then, excision of the deep sclera block. So, in this case, the, the you can see that knife is used for the excision. Then, scissors is used for the iridectomy. The peripheral iridectomy. This is a very essential step after excision of the deep block. It is very essential because it will determine whether the trap will fail or not. The iris usually prolapses through after creation of the sclerectomy. So the iridectomy, should, attempt should be made to make an iridectomy that is wider than the limbar fistula, that is the sclerectomy point. It is better that the iridectomy is too wide than if it is too small. Because if it is too small, uvea can occlude it. Uh, Hemorrhage, there could be hemorrhage, ephema that will occlude it, vitreous can occlude it. So it is better to have a wide iridectomy and ensure you see it intra up before leaving uh, occluding the high. If not, you keep cutting until you see it. So it's better it is too wide than too small. And th it, that's why it is uh, superior. The upper eyelid would cover, so there is no risk of diplopia. So it's better the iridectomy is wide. The scleral flap closure is usually done with a 10 hole nylon suture. Two or three interrupted suture can be used depending on whether you use a triangular flap or a rectangular flap and the uh, very hot suture knot. At this point, mattress um, releasable suture can also be put in order to guide the amount of to, to guide the amount of filtration to be able to manipulate the intraocular pressure you have, like a post up, if it is too low, if the intraocular pressure is too low, you can tighten your suture. If it is too high, uh, if it is too low, you release your suture. If it is too high, you tighten your suture. So this is the conjunctiva closure. Uh, for this conjunctiva closure, it is very very essential because it determines the lot post trabeculectomy. So attention to Due diligence is very essential during conjunctival closure. This is not the time you are in hurry. This is the time to calm down and do it well. So the closure is done with either interrupted suture or you do a mattress suture on the right, mattress suture on the left, then um, oh, it is called post string suture. Post string, sorry, post string suture on the right, post string suture on the left. The mattress suture, horizontal mattress suture, at the middle to ensure that you have a very tight, watertight closure of the conjunctiva. Because if this is not done, the risk of going back to the theater, the risk of blepitis, the risk of endophthalmitis for the patient is very high. So, after the closure, through the paracentesis that has been created, the anterior chamber is reformed, the bleb is elevated. The, why the anterior chamber is reformed with saline, you look at the bleb to see whether it's elevated or not, and that is an intra-hop confirmation that the bleb is functioning. So, and you also look for bleb leak, so that intra of you detect if there's any bleb leak, and you repair. The post-op care, follow-up is very, very essential in glaucoma, and it, is, it should be done closely. Because the success of trabeculectomy is 50% the surgery and 50% post-op care. 
So a patient that will not be able to come for uh, post op care should not be operated on. And when the surgeon knows that he or she will not be available for post op care for trabeculectomy, the surgery should not be done. So you keep the aim is to keep aqueous flowing, either through massage, laser suture lysis, if you observe that the, is, the pressure is still high, or removal of releasable scleral flap suture. So topical steroid is also ha is applied, usually for 6 to 12 weeks, as frequently as possible as the surgeon is comfortable with. So prophylactic anti topical antibiotics is given, like mosifloxacin, then cycloplegic agents, depending on the surgeon, and usually got a percent BD is given. The use of anti-metabolites. The anti-metabolites is associated with a ocul a over filtration and ocular hypotony actually. Before the use of anti-metabolites, uh, the use of ocular hypotony was uh, not so high, but with the use of anti-metabolite, it became so high. So, the, however, these anti-metabolites are essential, especially in horse blood, because we have a high risk of trabeculectomy failure. Then, when there is previous failed filtration surgery in a fecal glaucoma, secondary glaucoma, however, these are not uh, forms of primary open angle glaucoma. The one that concerns us is in this presentation is black with primary open angle glaucoma. It is essential to use anti-metabolite in travel. Now, the complications of trabeculectomy. This complication can either be intra-hop and post-operative. The intra-hop complication is better avoided, and when it happens, to attend to them. It can be but in holding of the conjunctiva, intra-hop, scleral flap tear, lens injury, hemorrhage, and choroidal effusion. The post-operative complication can either be heli or late. Heli wants hypotony. You can have hypotony with flat anterior chamber or deep anterior chamber. You can have elevated intraocular pressure with flat anterior chamber or deep anterior chamber. And you can also have snuff out phenomenon, which is the wipeout syndrome. The late, there could be thinning and leaking of the blood, overhanging blood, blood related infection, and cataract. When there is hypotony, is the anterior chamber flat? If it is flat, you think of leak blood, is the blood leaking? You do a CDL test. If the blood is leaking, I'll talk about the management soon. If, is, if the blood is not leaking, if the CDL is negative and the anterior chamber is flat, the intraocular pressure is also low, as low as less than 5, then you consider overfiltration. Is there choroidal effusion? At this point, this is essential through a, di uh, through a direct ophthalmoscope or a, a, a slit lamp examination with 78 or 90 D lens. And um, we also, it could also be another form. The post op, the pressure is low, but the anterior chamber depth is deep. Here, it is mainly caused by overfiltration. Is the uh, intraocular pressure elevated with flat anterior chamber? You think of aqueous misdirection, pupil bluff, delayed suprachoroidal hemorrhage. You can have cheap anterior chamber with a, an elevated intraocular pressure. Here, you know that the, the, the trabeculectomy is failing, and this could either be due to an internal block or episcleral block epistera fibrosis. So for the intra-op complication, to avoid button holding of the conjunctiva, you need to avoid the use of tooth forcep on the conjunctiva, avoid using cutting needles, avoid uh, cornea, the corneal traction sutures should be, should be placed rather than, um, rather than the, the superior rectus brittle suture. Then the repair of the uh, conjunctiva, if need, if need be, should be layered. If you need to repair uh, uh, the tenon, then repair the conch over it. Or if you observe, depending on what the surgeon is, is, is uh, the challenge the surgeon has at hand. So also to avoid anti-metabolite over the defect. And if you notice that you have anti-metabolite, you put sodium hyaluronate on it. Then if you have conjunctiva buttonhole already, a bandage contact lens, you can use a bandage contact lens post op or you use a uh, surgical. If you don't, it, it's better it is identified intra hop so that it is repaired. 
and if it is not identified intra or post up you have to go back to the theater to repair it if the bandage contact lens is not sufficient enough to close it then the sclera flap tear when the sclera is better avoided and but that is mainly by gentle gentle handling of the flap and why doing the flap dissection dig 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 to avoid a thin flap the flap should be two third about two third of the sclera thickness so avoid a thin flap and when you have the flap, no matter how thick it is, you have to undo it gently, otherwise it will tear. Then avoid cutting at the edges of the flap so that you won't have traction of the flap. So if sclera flap tear happens, you can get a donor sclera or pericardium to replace or to add to it to have ensure that it is the, the ostium is covered. And then you can also do a limber inch of the, the, the torn flap. You can inch it at the limbus with 10 O suture. And another thing is to go for a new site. Repair the torn one and look for another site. So, intra up, there could be lens injury and vitreous prolapse. This is most common during deep sclerectomy block remover. So, that is why it is advised not to have a too deep block. When the block is too deep, it injures the uh, lens and disrupt the vitreous. So during peripheral iridectomy, it's better to constrict pupil, constrict the pupil before you also do peripheral iridectomy because at this point, your cut, if you go too deep, you can also cut on the lens capsule. Kelly's, like I said earlier, Kelly's sponge should be used instead of banana scissors during um, the deep sclerect sclerectomy. Well, when you want to do paracentesis, it's better to go obliquely, to go at the plane of the iris, so that you don't go down. When you go down, you may injure the iris and the lens posterior to it. And you don't go too far inside, you can injure the lens capsule. So, and the treatment, if you have vit uh, vitreous already, it's better to do a sponge vitrectomy and a tighter flap closure. When there is a femur, identify the predisposing uh, condition whether pre-op, maybe the patient has um, his own blood thinners, uh, it's better to discontinue it for a while, like aspirin to discontinue or other uh, clopidogrel. So in that case, you need to communicate with the physician that prescribed those uh, anticoagulant medication and stop so that it won't, there won't be unnecessary ephema intra-op. And when you have it intra-op, it could be due to damage to the iris, and at that point, you need to be very careful. So you irrigate with copious saline and you may need to give epinephrine to constrict the bleeding vessel. And if you observe supracoroidal hemorrhage, actually the intraocular pressure pre-op should have been considered. However, if the intraocular pressure was considered and uh, with sudden the compression intra-op, the pressure still went, became very low and supracoroidal hemorrhage is observed. And this is when there is loss of the uh, uh, red reflex intra -hub. So it's better to do an, a loss of red reflex and immediate shallowing of the hasty. It's better to immediately stop the surgery, close the eye, and if possible, do a posterior sclerotomy or defer the surgery to a later date and monitor the patient clinically. Conjunctiva, when there's conjunctiva bleb leak, you reduce the steroid, apply a pressure pad, patch, the enlarged diameter contact lens can be used, fibrin glue, uh, or surgical repair if all this medical or conservative management fails. So if the anterior chamber is flat, you reform the anterior chamber using visco or hair or saline. If overfiltration is observed by having uh, this, the sildel is negative, the pressure is uh, low, less than 5, but the anterior chamber is shallow, or it may even be deep. So in that case, you reduce the steroid, you put pressure parts, a uh, cycloplegic agent is advised, large diameter contact lens or surgical repair. I'll talk about it soon. So when there is hypotony with shallow hasty and you are considering overfiltration, so you put a cigarette padding on the location of the bleb and allow the patient, uh, pad the high and allow the patient to be observed every 24 hours. The, bleb, the anterior chamber will become deeper. When there is choroidal hair fusion, this is 
on phonoscopy you could easily see visible hore aura the aura serrata is not vi easily visible but when you see it e readily on direct even on direct phonoscopy you know that and uh, there is corridor efficient and you see this ph phonoscopic feature you know that this is corridor efficient it should resolve spontaneously and if you notice that there there is a inflammation you give oral steroid so if there is prolonged hypotony with this corridor effusion for over four weeks and on ultrasound the kissing choroid is persistent and you are noticing a corneal lenticular touch that is a shallow ac it's better to drain the corridor effusion by doing a sclerotomy now if there is hypotony with a deep anterior chamber you do a and it's you you it, after doing cigarette padding and everything and it's still that way you you consider persistent hypotony and this can result in hypotony maculopathy so immediate treatment is essential otherwise it's going to be there's going to be irreversible vision loss so you reform the bulb bleb by injecting autologous blood into the bleb this will cause fibrosis of the bleb to reduce the filtration. So blood compression suture can be applied. Then surgically, the ostium that was created, the scleral flap on it may need to be tightened so to reduce the flow of aqueous. When there is elevated intraocular pressure with shallow anterior chamber, this shallow anterior chamber needs to be assessed. Is, it, is the anterior chamber evenly shallow or uh, axially shallow or peripherally shallow? So, when the exequious means direction, that is malignant glaucoma, the peripheral and axial anterior chamber are shallow. When there is pupil block, only the periphery is shallow. So, and when there is delayed supracorridor hemorrhage also, the periphery and axial uh, anterior chamber, they are shallow. So, the treatment for aqueous means direction. If you we are putting the, if you have put the patient on myotics like pilocarpine earlier for whatever reason you have to stop it, then place the patient on strong cytoplegic agent to allow for posterior rotation of the ciliary body and allow for aqueous drainage. Then topical steroid needs to be uh, given to the patient. Aqueous suppressant acutely that will reduce the intraocular pressure acutely, like uh, carbonic anhydrase in the bitter before going to some other ones. If all this fails, you can need you uh, one may need to disrupt the vitreous phase by using laser, pass planar vitrectomy, or needle aspiration. However, if the elevated intraocular pressure with shallow AC is due to pupillary block, it is better to do a peripheral iridectomy or iridotomy, avoid cyclopegic agent, give topical steroid, aqueous suppressant, and maltis. So, in the treatment of elevated intraocular pressure with deep AC, that is due to inadequate filtration. This inadequate filtration could be at the level of the um, sclera flap. Maybe the flap was too tight, tightly repaired. And it can also be at the episclera level. Maybe there's ongoing rapid fibrosis resulting in tenum cyst or um, the bleb appear failing. So in this case, you you need to identify, is it that the blood is failing? Is it that there's tenon cyst? You identify. So if there is internal block at the level of the flap, is it that at the level of the ostium, is it that the flap covering the ostium is too tight, you release it? Is it that the iris is occluding the ostium? Is it that the ciliary body is blocking? Was there vitreous loss and vitreous is clogging? Was there a female with blood clogged? So all this can be identified using gonioscopy. So you don't presume, you identify. And if it is external block due to tenon cyst or episterial scarring, you also identify using slit slam. So the most important thing is to restore blood function by using increasing the frequency of the anti-inflammatory agent, using laser suture lysis. Then to reduce the intraocular pressure, you can do digital massage. You may need to teach the patient to how to do this digital massaging or the patient relations. Medication can also be given, topical medication. However, prostaglandin analog and primolidin should be avoided in this patient. 
Systemic medication can also be given. For blocked internal osteum, intracameral tissue plasminogen activator can be given. This will lyse the clot that is blocking. A laser therapy can also be given. This will lyse the high risk of vitreous that is blocking. And you may also need to revise the blip. If the, it is due to epistleral scarring, you may need to excise or incise, incise the scar tissue by separating the conjunctiva from the sclera using a spatula or you do needling, needling with 5 chlorouracil or mitomycin C. So to needle, we produce, the aim of, the, of needling is to produce a more diffuse and better functioning blip. So it's either done at the sling lamp or intra-op. This depends on the surgeon expertise, the patient, is the patient cooperative, and the environment. So informed consent is obtained, antibiotic drops, you clean the patient, position the patient, then it is, so you advance the blood with a twisting motion using a spatula. So, and however, while you are doing this, avoid putting hole. So after this, mitomycin C or 5 chlorouracil is injected 5 to 10 millimeters away from the blip. That is about 180 degrees away from the blip. So, so this is a picture showing how needling is done. This is a blunt spatula and a, a smooth motion back and forth to separate the conch from the sclera. So this is it. So, however, when bullying is done, there could be resultant hypotonic resulting from conjunctival botting hole or aggressive needling. There could be debitis and optomitis. So, is, in this case, if all these risk factors appear, are borne in mind, it's better to do needling in the theater and observe all the aseptic procedures. The anti-metabolites that are used also have their own side effect, local irritation, epiphora, allergy, keratoconjunctivitis and uh, whether to use mitomycin C or 5-fluorouracil. Several studies have shown that the results from both are comparable in terms of intraocular pressure reduction and blep appearance. And mitomycin C has a success rate of 68.4% and white 5 fluorouracil has, a, has a, a success rate of 77.8%. So this is an algorithm showing everything I've been talking about, trabeculectomy and the complication that can arise how to identify it and how to treat it. Other early complications, late complications, these are the late complications, thinning and leaking of blood, lag overhanging blood, blood related infection and cataract. This number two surgical option in the management of primary open angle glaucoma is canaloplasty. Canaloplasty, the management is directed at the Schlenz canal. This is to re-establish flow from arterial chamber to the restored canal of Schlem. And this one achieves physiologic control of intraocular pressure without requiring a blep. It is a non-penetrating procedure with three cystic cannulation and vasodilatation of Schlem's canal, viscodilatation of Schlem's canal, and circumferential suture tensioning of the trabecular meshwork can also be done. So this is deep sclerectomy. At, at this point, the there is peritome, peritome is done, sclera flap is raised, and another f and in another inner flap is raised, and you can see at this point, you can see the uvea. You can see the the the, the trabecular meshwork becomes or becomes obvious. So, excision of this trabecular meshwork is done. And this exposes the posterior uh, the, the posterior Schlem's canal. So after this has been done, this the picture below, viscocanalostomy. So this is uh, an instrument, a blunt round instrument that is inserted into the Schlem's canal. It's going into the Schlem's canal. It's uh, this is a visco cannula. Sorry, this is a visco cannula, and visco is injected into the Schlem's canal on both sides in order to dilate the Schlem's canal. So a, a stent can also be put 360 degree to, 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 to stent the Schlem's canal. The viscocanaloplasty dilates the canal and this may increase permeability of the trabecular meshwork also. 
the dialysis hostel of the collector channel. In this case, the suture that is used is the nine hole polypropylene suture. So it maintains the slim canal opening to avoid fluid, to allow fluid to flow circumferentially, and it places tension on the trabecular measure. So this mechanic, this this is just like uh, using pilocarpine. So it it, it uh, places tension on the on the on the canal. It open to open it up and allow fluid to drain. So preoperatively, this this is a, an ultrasound image. It, it's looking like an ultrasound image. So this this is preoperatively, the. The slim canal is not obvious at the angle. This is the angle. This is the iris. This is the cornea. This is the angle. This is the slim canal. No, nothing is obvious. But after a uh, visco canalostomy, the, the slim canal became obvious. This is the post op ultrasound image. And the this shows the slim canal and connector channel. So Microcatheter can also be used during canaloplasty. In this case, a flexible microcatheter with lighted picking tip is used, and the viscoelastic is injected to dilate the entire 360. I've, I've explained this earlier. So the advantages of canaloplasty. Data from multicenter clinical trial with three-year follow-up showed that uh, intraocular pressure reduction of 35 to 41 percent is achieved, and there is low post-operative complication rate. No late acrotony or other late complication associated with the penetrating trabeculectomy. Surgical option three: glaucoma drainage devices (GDD). Indications: They are indicated in neovascular glaucoma um, and all these areas. However, we are interested in open angle glaucoma. When open angle glaucoma is done, uh, when the patient has open primary open angle glaucoma has done trabeculectomy and if trabeculectomy fails, then a glaucoma drainage device will be the next option to consider. So what else are these devices? Examples, we have open tube drainage devices. Examples are Marvet implant, Morteno implant, Shocket tube implant. And we have flow restricted or valved devices. This includes Ahmed valve, Cooping implant. Others, high stent, hairspray device, salt board, Optimate to sana glaucoma implant. So the barvet, this is a description of a barvet valve, is a non valve agent. I don't want to go through this because of time. But in a, in placing a valve, in placing a valve, perotomy perotomy is done superiorly, then blunt dissection is done to create a space, especially subtenon space. The rectal muscles are identified. Usually, the implants are placed superotemporally. So, you identify the lateral rectus muscle and the superior rectus muscle. So, the plates, the implant plate, this is a picture showing the implant. The implant plate is placed in between the rectal muscles. And these two are then, uh, it is, it is su sutured down to the sclera. To hold it down. So the overhanging end of the plate is placed beneath the muzzle, while the center of the plate is between the rectile muscles. So this tubing is then placed on is on the sclera, and it is the a, a canal is created on the sclera for passage of this tube. However, before the tube is passed into the anterior chamber. It is measured so that it will not be too long inside the anterior chamber and co have contact with the endothelium, corneal endothelium. So it is cut. You don't want it to be too long. You don't want it to be too short. So it is cut to about uh, uh, seven, between seven to eight mm before you put it, in, before it is implanted into the anterior chamber through a sclera canal. So this is what this is trying to say. The plate is, this is the plate being put into, uh, in between the rectal muscles. This is the tubing. This is the limbus. So it is measured. Then a, a, a canal, it is placed through a canal in the sclera to the anterior chamber.
So after the pleasure of the tube, placement of the tube into the anterior chamber, considering having a good length of it in the AC, the, the sclera is repaired on the tube to ensure it is held in place and the conjunctiva over it is also repaired. So the surgeon, some surgeon construct a sclera tunnel to cover the tube and some may not construct a tunnel. Some may place it, then look for a graft, a, scler uh, a, a sclera patch, a sclera patch, some are ready-made, are placed on the tube and repaired on it. And some, uh, some may create a flap, like trabeculectomy flap, and some may use a needle to create a tunnel big enough to allow the tubing of the glaucoma drainage device to pass through. So it depends on the surgeon expertise. And this flap should be repaired subsequently. A flap is a graft can be placed on it and uh, the conjunctiva repaired on it. Usually the tube is covered with some sterile biodegradable tissue such as donor sclera, pericardium, or dura, all of which seem to be equally efficacious. The conjunctiva is repositioned to carefully cover the tube and overlying patch graft. So this is a description of the maternal implant. So this is the Morteno implant. It is wider than the Hamed valve. The plate is wider than the Hamed valve. So this is the placement I was trying to explain in between the rectal muscles. And this is the tube. I, I don't know if you can see my cursor. This is the tube in the AC, anterior chamber. So this is a, the description of the shocker tube shunt. This is the description of the Hamed glaucoma valve implant. So. I want to talk a bit about this. The silicon tube of Hamed valve is connected to a silicon sheet valve held in a silicon body. And this is the model. The valve mechanism, the thin silicon elastoma membrane, 8 to 7 mm wide, is used, which allow one way regulation. So, the inlet cross section is wider than the house legs. So, small pressure differential between the anterior chamber and the subconjunctiva space allows the valve to function. So, it is pressure. The, the, this is a valve device, so the, the opening or closing of the valve is dependent on a pressure gradient between the anterior chamber and subconjunctiva space. When the pressure in the anterior chamber is high, it will open up the valve and it will drain. When the pressure is low, the valve is closed. So the principle of the Hamed valve is said to be explained by the Venturi effect uh, in the uh, um, Bernoulli equation uh, principle, this you just described the effects of constricting flow of fluid. When you constrict the flow of fluid and you release it, there is a subsequent increase in velocity of flow of fluid and subsequent reduction in pressure. So that's the principle on which it is based. This is the Hamed valve. The other valve, the plates are bigger, like I said. But for the Hamed valve, the plate is smaller, such that it can just be placed between the lateral rectus and the superior rectal muscle. But for the Morteno, the plate is wide. It has to be tucked in under the rectal muscles. And this is the tube. This is the cutting bevel up inside the anterior chamber. So the grouping is also a valve implant. Now, complications of glaucoma drainage devices. Intra hop, there could be bleeding. There could be misdirection of the silicon into the posterior chamber in the presence of peripheral anterior sinicate. And there could be flat anterior chamber if both size is large. Um, the glaucoma drainage device can be, the tubing can be placed in the anterior chamber directly, and it can also be placed through the pass planner to the anterior chamber. So, the early postoperative complications are hypotony, uh, increased uh, intraocular pressure due to occlusion, either by iris, and this can be corrected using a yag ablation of the iris, tube cornea contact, the, and this should be avoided intraoperatively. If it is not avoided and it happens postoperatively, you have to go back into the theater to remove the tube and reduce the length, and there could be early postoperative endotomitis. Late post-op complications of the glaucoma drainage devices, there could be an insisted bleb, there could be erosion of the tube. The tube can be eroded out of the anterior chamber. There could be plate migration, 
there could be limitation of the high, of high movement because the 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 rectal muscles are are, are affected are touched intra hop so there could be inflammation of those muscles but subsequently with use of topical steroid and with time it resolves and it will reduce end of termites there could be end of termites there could be epithelial hinge growth and invasion into the fibrous capsule sterile hypopion irregular pupil due to addition of the iris root to the tube inside the anterior chamber globe perforation retinal detachment supracoroidal hemorrhage due to overfiltration um, vitreous hemorrhage and choroidal effusion so this is is a, a, a glaucoma drainage device in situ and uh, these are the complications so this is femur. this occurs as a result of trauma to the iris in, intra hub so this is ifema and nobody wants ifema post glaucoma surgery so this is hypotony this is the picture showing a patient with hypotony post gdt and there could be inflammation with fibrin subsequently after the ifema you can see the uvia tissue is inside the tube in the third in the third picture so the tube the tubes can be blocked by the iris as seen in this picture there could be blood in the tube the tube can be also blocked by vitreous and the tube may be too short so here we can see tube cornea touch here the cornea is already hazy so too long tube extruded here the tube has been extruded it's, it's obvious and uh, it can also be exposed when the conjunctival over it is too, too thin so this the picture shows an exposed amed plates here the plate even the plate is exposed so an endophthalmitis is a, can happen so this is a a plate that's a malpositioned plate with diplopia. You can see this looks like a maternal plate because the plate is very white. So it's the this wing is supposed to be under the rectal muscle. It is tucked in. So it was not tucked in or it was tucked in and it got extruded. So it becomes malpositioned and the patient can have diplopia. This is it. Surgical option, the minimally invasive glaucoma surgery, this is the number four, and it is indicated in cases of mild to moderate glaucoma, severe or refractory glaucoma, coexisting cataract and glaucoma, and also as a first line treatment of primary open angle glaucoma. So, and the factors that determine it, the severity of glaucoma, target IOP, so the approach minimally invasive glaucoma surgery actually basically approaches the anterior chamber angle maximizing the anatomy and uh, physiologic uh, uh, control or, or drainage of intraocular per, uh, uh, of aqueous so the approaches are one it increases aqueous outflow by bypassing the justa canalicular meshwork and this allows fluid to drain directly into the slime canal from the anterior chamber and it can achieve this by stenting the TM using eye stent devices, eye stent inject, hydros micro stent. These are improvements. Eye stent inject is an improvement on the high stent. Hydros micro stent is an improvement over eye stent inject. This can uh, this aqueous house flow can also be achieved by excision of the TM. This is achieved by using the Kahoot dual play goniotomy, trabectomy, goniotomy assisted transluminal trabeculotomy and then you can also dilate the slime canal using half internal canaloplasty then the approach number two is by increasing aqueous heart flow via the supracoroidal pathway using the supracoroidal shunt the cypress and the high stent supra so a subconjunctival drainage pathway can also be achieved by using the zengel uh, devices it can also be achieved by reducing aqueous production from the ciliary body, either by using endocyclophotocoagulation, micropost laser cyclophotocoagulation, or cyclophotocoagulation uh, plus. So these are the mixed devices. The first generation is stent, the stent glaucose, 
So this is the stent glucose in the anterior uh, chamber angle, draining fluid from the anterior chamber straight to the Schlem's canal, bypassing the trabecular meshwork. So this is eye stent inject, a second generation, an improvement over the first generation. So. So uh, I don't want to, for, for time constraints, I'm trying to. So this is hydros implants. These are longer. So instead of using the shorter, smaller um, eye stent devices, the hydros implant is longer and it creates a scaffold within the uh, trabecular meshwork such that it opens it up and fluid can drain from the anterior chamber straight to the Schlem's canal and into the collector channels. So the second mechanism of uh, mixed devices is the trabecular meshwork bypass by tissue excision. So in this case, we have the Kahoot dual blade goniotomy. So here, the preoperative pilocapine can be used in patients undergoing the procedure, but without feco uh, emulsification, because it's usually a combined sub procedure with cataract surgery. But if the patient is not having cataract surgery, pilocapine can be instilled. And uh, the patient held is tilted approximately 30 to 45 degrees away from the surgeon, and the microscope is tilted 45 degrees towards the surgeon. Paracentesis is done. A temporal clear cornea incision of at least 1.5 mm is created. Viscoelastic is infused into the AC to deepen the nasal angle and uh, to push the endothelium away from the operating area. Then a direct corneal prism is implanted, is placed on the cornea. So the device is inserted through the cornea incision sideways and the sharp tip of the blade is inserted through the trabecular meshwork and into the Schlem's canal. So the blade has two ends, the double-ended blade. So after the TM is placed, the blade is advanced in a clockwise or counterclockwise manner depending on the surgeon for approximately three to five clock hours. So as the device is advanced, the ramp gently stretches the TM why the dual blade creates parallel incision to generate a strip of the TM. And once the trabecular meshwork is stripped off, the Schlem's canal becomes obvious. And this is evidenced by bleeding from that area. So, so by when this is achieved, it shows that the anterior chamber the air is directly uh, is, is direct with the Schlem's canal and aqueous can flow directly into the Schlem's canal. So a large strip of trabecular meshwork can be removed with the intraocular forceps and small strips of trabecular meshwork left in place. So another method is the trabectome. This works by removing a strip of trabecular meshwork and the inner wall of the Schlem's canal. So in Kahoot dual blade, just the trabecular meshwork is removed. But in trabectome, the trabecular meshwork and the inner wall of the Schlem's canal is removed such that there is even direct access to the collector channels. So the device consists of a single-use disposable handpiece that performs as electrocautery, irrigation, and aspiration. So it's like um, using cautery to disrupt the trabecular mesh, uh, the angle structures, and expose the slim scanner, uh, the connector channels straight up. So the gonioscopy assisted transluminal trabeculotomy now is a form of trabeculotomy with eye track microcatheter or sutures. Here, paracentesis is also done, clear cornea incision is made, and gonioscopy lens in, uh, uh, placed on the cornea. So a gonioscopy is made in the nasal trabecular meshwork, which serves as the entry point for the eye track microcatheter, as seen in this picture. Paracentesis is done, and this is the this is the eye track microcatheter. The microcatheter has an illuminated distal tip to allow for visualization during advancement of the catheter through the slim scanner. So the microsurgical forceps are used to advance the microcatheter into the slim scanner circumferentially. The distal end of the catheter is grabbed and the proximal end is distracted out of the eye. So this shares the trabecular meshwork to create a 360-degree trabeculotomy. 
So Trap360 is also another device that can be used. So we have the hub internal canaloplasty. Here, the canaloplasty is, uh, the, cana um, the angle surgery is performed from inside, from the angles, using a, uh, a gonio, gonio device, a gonio lens. So, it, and it uses an high track microcatheter to open the Slimes canal. So, a clear cornea incision is also made. The microcatheter is inserted, then through a small opening in the trabecular measure into the Slimes canal. So, Achaeus, uh, to enhance Achaeus outflow through the supracorridor space, this is another mechanism the minimally invasive glaucoma surgery uses, and the devices are the high stem supra and side pass micro stem. You can see in this picture that this is the device G3 stent. It is implanted, it is implanted here between, between at the level of the ciliary body. It is implanted to drain fluid straight up from the aqueous, from the anterior chamber to the supracorridor space. So there's no manipulation of the conjunctiva or sclera here. So the stent is positioned on a guide wire which is passed across the anterior chamber and used to bluntly dissect the ciliary body from the sclera spot. So it creates something like a cyclodialysis then into the supracorridor space. It's not stopping there. The device goes from the ciliary body, from the ciliary body, from the ciliary body and the sclera spot to the supracorridor space. So this is the device again in the AC between the sterile spore and the ciliary body into the supracorridor space. This is how it will look. So the the side pass micro stent received approval from the FDA in July 2006 for use in conjunction with cataract surgery. But the device was withdrawn from the market in August 2018 based on results of five-year compass XT trial, which demonstrated a significant decrease in cornea endothelial cell count in patients undergoing cypass. So another mechanism is shunting aqueous outflow into the subconjunctival space. Here, Zengel, Zen glaucoma treatment system is used. It decreases IOP, intraocular pressure, by creating a permanent drainage shunt from the anterior chamber to the subconjunctival space through a sclera channel. So the device is loaded in a single-use terra injector, which is used to implant the stent through the TM across the sclera. So this is the Zengel device. This is the device it preloaded in, uh, and inserted. Preloaded and inserted through the sclera to the subconjunctival space directly from the anterior chamber angle. So the intended area of placement in the supero nasal quadrant, which is 3 mm from the nimbus, is marked. So mitomycin C or 5 fluoroacyl is injected and massaged over the area. So some some can just put a cotton tip soaked in it in mitomycin C over it, over the area. So a small self sealing clear cornea incision is made in ferro temporarily. So and the visco is used. The injector tip is placed through the cornea incision, directed through the main incision and across the anterior chamber towards the superonasal quadrant. Here, this is the injector. That is the preloaded implant. So the gonial lens is placed so that you can view the angle structure. The injector is advanced, but before then, a gonial lens needs to be placed before they get to the um, to the angle structure to the square so that there can be proper visualization. So the needle, the injector needle is tunneled through the square and then uh, it is pushed in at that point. <laughs> So we have the express mini shot, in focus micro shot, and then another mechanism is to reduce aqueous production by ciliary body ablation. In this case, the, the, the destruction, the aqueous is produced by the ciliary body. So there's destruction of the ciliary body epithelium to reduce aqueous production. So this is the procedure.
the approach, it can be limber and it can be past planner approach. So we have the endocycle photocoagulation plus. In this case, an endocycle photocoagulation with extension of treatment 1 to 2 mm until the past planner is done. And this is to aggressively reduce intraocular pressure. It is indicated in cases of a refractory, uh, refractory elevated intraocular pressure. So, generally, minimally invasive glaucoma surgery have, have internal approach and have shown to have few complications compared to the traditional trabeculectomy, even the glaucoma drainage devices. However, the surgeon may have challenges using a corneal lens or locating the trabecular measure. So it is important to prevent and manage excessive blood flow during this procedure. So they are, these are their complications of each of the devices, as I stand, Kahudra blade, they all have their complications, though they are better procedures than the conventional trabeculectomy. Now, to cataract surgery. The impact of cataract surgery on the evaluation of glaucoma. Cataract worsens the mean deviation across all tests of the visual field, and it affects the visual field index, that is the glaucoma projection, progression index, as well as characterization of scotoma. So underestimation of the it also causes underestimation of the thickness of the retinal nerve layer. So doing cataract surgery produces a significant and sustained intraocular pressure reduction in individuals with primary open angle glaucoma, and uh, it achieves a long-term intraocular pressure reduction of about two to four millimeters of mercury, and these have been studied proven in several studies. And it also improves the practitioner's ability to interpret perimetric testing and optic nerve imaging because there is a clearer view and the patient have a better vision while doing this perimetric test. So the cataract surgery can be done alone. It can be combined with glaucoma surgery, either trabeculectomy, uh, glaucoma drainage devices, minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. So and in this procedure is a two-phased and it can also be a two-phase procedure. You do the glaucoma surgery first, subsequently cataract surgery. But you can also do the cataract surgery first and glaucoma surgery subsequently. The choice of what to do, whether to do cataract surgery first, cataract surgery with glaucoma surgery, or glaucoma surgery first, depends on the extent of the glaucomatous damage, the type of the patient, the, uh, the surgeon's expertise, the number of topical medication the patient is taking, the target pressure you want to achieve, and the cornea endothelium. So the cornea endothelium and pupillary integrity. So the challenges you may have while doing combined surgery, you can have small pupil, you can have posterior sinicate, there could be abnormally shallow or deep anterior chamber, the donors could be weakened if you have pseudo exfoliation. So if you do the cataract surgery alone, the advantages you can have includes quick recovery with rapid, rapid visual recovery of the patient. The patient have improved quality of life and they sustain intraocular pressure lowering. And the people that can have cataract surgery alone are people with mild to moderate glaucoma and people that require few medications for the control of their intraocular pressure. The advantage of doing cataract surgery alone is that the intraocular pressure lowering effect is less than in combined surgery, and the intraocular pressure needs close monitoring both the early and late postoperative period. Pharmacologic control of the high OP may be needed postoperatively. So it just the reduction is two to four percent. So it may not be significant if doing cataract surgery alone is what the patient opts for. So combined surgery are indicated in when there's cataract and medically uncontrolled glaucoma, the need for early treatment of the glaucoma, like in advanced cases, and there is also significant cataract. So the, the advantages is that it minimizes anesthetic risk by combining two procedures in one. It's convenient for the patient with one trip to the operating room rather than two. It's cost saving. There is opportunity to improve vision and also to reduce intraocular pressure at the same time. However, if you do combined surgery, you may not be able to achieve a, a effective intraocular pressure in the long term, and there is increased there may be increased risk of com, uh, complication of two procedures. If one procedure is done, the complication is lesser than when you have done two procedures. Then there is slower visual recovery than when cataract surgery alone is done.
In conclusion, the surgical management of primary open hangul glaucoma is diverse and can be offered to eligible patients. The goal is to increase efficacy, to achieve lower pressure in patients who have more advanced disease and higher pressure. So trabeculectomy, glaucoma drainage devices, and minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries are doable, they are affordable, and they are de uh, de uh, effective depending on the patient uh, upon which it is done. Thank you for listening, and these are my references.